I see you, Mom. I see you, Mama. I see you, Mommy. I see you, Mother. I see me. Thank you. Thank you. I love you. Happy Mother's Day. I see you. New Mama, snuggling your baby you want to share with family and friends. Mama of Littles, making games, crafts, and snacks from morning until day's end. Now homeschooling Mama, wearing this new hat. Mama of Mamas, missing your grandkiddos in your lap. Expecting Mama, looking forward to your first embrace. Praying for a child. In this season, asking for grace. Spiritual Mama, encouraging the younger generation in this race. I see you. Mama leaving your family to work on the front lines. Mama watching your brave daughter nurse others through this time. Mama who is celebrating milestones in new creative ways. Mama who is our biggest cheerleader each and every day. Our comfort while our world is in disarray. Thank, Thank you. you. I love you. Happy Mother's Day. I see you. Mama who is tired but trusting. Mama who is juggling but joyful. Mama who is busy but blessed. Mama who is waiting, but worshiping. Thank you. I love you, Mom. I love you, Mom. Happy, Happy Mother's, Mother's Day. Day. Mom, I see you. You are brave, soft, and strong. You are a safe, warm, and a hopeful song. You are a loving teacher, a praying warrior, and a place where I belong. Thank you, Mom. You're awesome. We love you. Happy, Happy Mother's, Mother's Day. Day. Well, happy Mother's Day to all the moms joining us this morning. Single moms, grandmas, great grandmas, spiritual mothers. You all carry the honorable role of mother in somebody's life and the weight that comes with that. As you know, the privilege of motherhood comes with joys unspeakable as well as many tears, but nothing moves us quite as deeply as the well-being of our children. Regardless of the age, we always carry them in our hearts. A mother will wear many hats and assume multiple roles in her children's lives. So I want to share with you just some of the hats that we get to wear. The first one I call the interior designer hat. Now I'm not talking about furniture in the home, but we all know the saying, if mom is happy, everyone is happy. We play a significant role in creating warm and peaceful atmospheres in our homes and making home a haven for our children and our families. The second one is the teacher hat. Many of you can probably relate more than ever to this one, especially having your children at home during the season. Our children learn more from us by what they see us do than by what they hear us say. Now, none of us parent perfectly, and we are thankful for God's grace, but we do have this unique position to model a godly life for our children. They watch us interact. They learn social skills from us. They watch us forgiving one another. They learn how to be generous and to love people. We are always wearing this teacher hat. And then the next one is what I call the comforter hat. And one of the characteristics and names of the Holy Spirit is that of comforter. He comforts us and he speaks peace to our souls. And as mothers, we have multiple opportunities to comfort our children, to soothe them, but how much more can we give when we draw our strength from the great comforter? So let me encourage you today that even on those difficult days and those tough moments, he never runs dry and he will give you the comfort that you need to give your children. He will fill you up so that you can pour out over and over again. Let's talk about the wisdom hat. You know, when our children are six, we hear them say, my mom is cleverer than your mom. They get excited when we're the secret reader coming to school. But then at 16, not so much. We will hear, mom, you don't understand. I know what I'm doing. And then around 26, it's mom, what do you think about this? And now even in my 50s, I start to remember things that my mom taught me, just wise words that she gave. You see, the wisdom and counsel that you give your children will take root in their hearts and they will remember your wise words even when they might not acknowledge that to you because your words and counsel to them is never wasted. Then there's the hat of cheerleader. A cheerleader's main role is to cheer for their team and encourage them to win. And mom, you are appointed and anointed by God to be their biggest cheerleader. 
by speaking life-giving words over your children. They will hear things from you. I'm so proud of you. You made a great decision. I love your choice. I will always love you. God has called you to be a warrior. You're strong like a lion. You see, we have a God-given authority to build up our children, to speak God's definition over them. Our words release life, they release healing, they release identity. So no matter what your role as mother might look like, I want to say thank you to you. Thank you for the multiple hats that you wear every day. Thank you for the sacrifices you make so that your children may thrive. We at Northland celebrate you and we want to wish you a very happy Mother's Day. Well, good morning and welcome to Northlands Church. As Michelle's already expressed, happy Mother's Day to all the moms in our community. We are grateful for the gifts that you are in our lives. If it's your very first time tuning in with us, a special welcome to you. My name is Tyler. I'm a part of the Northlands family here, and we're so glad that you've decided to join us today. Just to give you an idea of what to expect, we're going to kick off with a time of worship led by Caitlin and Christian Klein and the rest of our worship team. And then we have a message from our senior leader, Greg Haswell, that we're looking forward for you to hear. Uh, if I could, I'd love to open us in a time of prayer and expectation. Holy Spirit, thank you so much for today. Thank you for the work that you're doing in our lives. We are grateful for your Lordship. Lord, I pray that you do what only you can do, and that is to transform our hearts and our minds. Would you lead us into greater revelation of you and your goodness? Lord, be with us today and this week as we continue to navigate through uh, this time of pandemic. Would you be with us in every step of the way and watch over our families? In Jesus' name, amen. Once again, welcome to Northlands Church, and I'd love to hand it off to our worship team at this time.
a thousand generations in your family and your children and their children and their children may his favor be upon you in a thousand generations in your family and your children and their children and their children may his favor be upon you in a thousand generations Children and their children and their children may his face be upon you in a thousand generations in your family and your children and their children and their children may his presence go before you and behind you and beside you all around you and within you he is with
You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let As always, thank you once again to our worship team. We're so grateful for the strength and gift that you're bringing during this season. And we absolutely agree that the Lord is good. As part of our worship, we love to share testimonies and story about the Lord's might and His goodness in our lives. And today we have a very special story from one of the moms in our community, Robin Johnson. She wants to share her story of how the Lord brought her into motherhood. I'm looking forward to you to hear this. Check it out. Hello, my name is Robin Johnson. There was a season in my life when May was a particularly hard month for me. While I love celebrating Mother's Day with my mom, it was also a painful reminder of an unfulfilled dream I had to be a mom. What should have been a natural, easy, exciting next step for my husband and me as a young married couple turned into a painful cycle of doctor visits, tests, procedures, soaring hopes, and brutal disappointments. I was saved when I was a little girl and I believed in the power of prayer and that I served a good God. But as the months and years passed, doubt and unbelief joined me on this journey. I knew God was good, but I just wasn't sure He wanted to be good to me. Then something happened. God showed me two scriptures in His Word that changed everything. The first was Psalms 113.9 and it says, he settles the barren woman in her home as a happy mother of children. There it was, my assurance that God did indeed want to be good to me. And in Proverbs 18, 21, there's death and life in the power of the tongue. Those who love it will eat its fruit. I believe every revelation of God's goodness that produces faith in our heart will also call us to action. And the Lord was inviting me to speak life. It didn't feel like a formula or a performance. It felt like a response to what He was saying to me. I knew God was doing something more in my life. Ty Hannell, a pastor here at Northlands Church, said it this way recently, more than giving you something or taking you somewhere, God is making you someone. I felt like that was what was happening in my life. So I had a new plan. I was gonna to continue to go to the doctor and do everything I knew in the natural, but I was going to trust God that He wanted to be good to me and speak life. It wasn't easy. It felt silly and awkward to say things like, I have a healthy reproductive system. The Lord's selling me in my home as a happy mother. Children are my heritage from the Lord. I have the power of life in my words. But I did say them, in a tiny, wobbly, shaky whisper to only those closest to me. I wish I could say that I was pregnant the next month, but I wasn't. 
And I really wish I could say that I wasn't more disappointed than ever. I had a lot of conversations with doubt and unbelief as they tried to convince me that they were right. All the evidence in the natural was against me, but there was something about those two verses. They felt so real, so alive, so compelling. I decided that no matter what, I was gonna trust that God wanted to be good to me. It was not an easy decision, and sometimes I doubted, but I, I continued to believe in His Word, and I've continued to speak life. On October 9th, 1987, I held my promise in my arms. And again on September 15th, 1990, I held another promise in my arms. Through His miraculous power, God had made me a happy mother of children. Looking back, He was doing way more than fulfilling a promise. He was also transforming me and maturing me in the process. The foundation that God is good and speaking life are two spiritual truths that continue to bear fruit in my life in every area to this day. If you find yourself in a similar journey, I believe with all my heart, the Lord wants to give you the desires of your heart. I also believe He will use this season to transform you into someone He planned before He ever formed you in your mother's womb. I bless you today. I declare you a happy mother of children. May your heart be seared with God's promises to you and may this journey lay a strong foundation for the good works God planned in advance for you. Robin, thank you once again for sharing your story. So grateful for you. As every single week we've reminded ourselves, the reason we share testimonies is because the word testimony, it means do it again, God. The scripture says, faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. And so when we hear stories, faith in our hearts and souls begin to rise. And if the Lord does something in one of our lives, it's a standard that He wants to do it in all of our lives. He continually wants to reveal His power in nature to us and through our own stories. And so as we hear stories like Robin, I believe that there's an invitation for each one of us to respond, to extend our faith towards the Lord and say, Lord, would you do that in my life? Something that we've shared often at Northlands is that the Lord is with us in what we've called the long battles. Perhaps you've been battling with something for a really long time, weeks, months, even years, but the Lord is always faithfully walking with us every step of the way. Sometimes we see His power and might move very quickly, and sometimes it takes time. And so while we are waiting on the Lord, we're going to trust that He is still good and faithful, and we're going to trust Him to see His power demonstrated in our lives. Would you extend your faith? today. Would you extend your faith and say, Lord, would you do it in my life just as you've done it in Robbins? Would you pray with me? Holy Spirit, we thank you for all the work that you are doing in our lives. Lord, right now I ask that you would demonstrate your power. Lord, that you would break through even in the long battles, that you would bring us into deliverance, that you would bring us into places of peace and breakthrough. Supernatural stories, Lord, I'm praying would, would spring up during this time. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, before we jump into today's message, I just want to remind us once again, northland.church forward slash newsletter is where you can get all the information and resources during this time while we're not physically together and gathering here at the building. Things like our daily devotion, we would encourage you to check that out, as well as the fact that Monday to Friday, we have a daily Zoom prayer time in the afternoon. We would love for you to join us for that and pray with us. Now, with that being said, I'd love to hand it off to our senior leader, Greg Haswell, as he brings today's message. I want to talk today about the grace of both being able to give and to receive. The scriptures talk about this grace, that it's a gift of God. The, one of the graces like leadership and administration and showing mercy is this uh, ability to give generously. But I'm intrigued by the concept of, uh, especially at this time, of how we can both give and receive with grace because it's part of something the Lord wants to do. 
every time the Holy Spirit is given lordship and mastery over a church in the New Testament, you find this presiding lordship of the Holy Spirit means that he uh, distributes to people as they have need. So he'll whisper to one person who has a little bit of excess, why don't you give to that person over there? And as they do, he, he brings great blessing into the life of the person who donated and he brings great blessing into the life of the person who received. And both of those aspects should be covered, anointed, suffused with grace because the spirit of grace is orchestrating a beautiful, beautiful something. Right at this time, there are some of us who are, are, have a little bit extra and are in plenty. And there are some of us who are in need. And I think many people who may have lost their jobs or being furloughed would be saying, I, I have a need. So in Philippians 4.15, Paul writes this. He says, moreover, as you Philippians know, when we were early days in our acquaintance with you, that no other church shared, for us, shared with us in this matter of giving and receiving. You're the only church who did that. There was this grace of giving and receiving. And in 2 Corinthians, Paul writes to the Corinthians and says a very similar thing. He says, but since you excel in everything else, in your faith, in your speech, in your knowledge, and in complete earnestness in the love that has been kindled in you, see to it that you also excel in this grace of giving. I wanted to talk about this need for grace. So if you're somebody who has a little bit of extra money and who's saying, I'd like to deploy this as some way to help somebody. And if you're somebody who's saying, I have a need right now, I'm going to invite you to say, Lord, what would you have me do? To the people who have a lot, I, I think the Lord is going to whisper to you about where you should give. And to the people who don't have, I think the Lord's going to whisper to you some steps of obedience that may be helpful to you at this time. Either way, we want to be the kind of people who listen to what the Holy Spirit is saying. And if you'd like to involve the church leaders in this deliberation process, either if you have a need or if you have excess and you'd like to help meet needs, why don't you call your congregational pastor and say, I'd like to make a contribution or if there is some money, I'd, I'd like to receive some. And if you can include them, they will treat it with uh, dignity and with care and uh, with anonymity if you would require that. And they will just see to it that that's administrated with as much grace as we can. There is a grace to giving and a grace to receiving. And I'm going to be praying that you have the grace to do both in this season. As usual, if you would like to support us, you can give to the food pantry or to the benevolent fund. And we will administrate those on your behalf to people who are in need. I just want to take a moment and say thank you. The response has been overwhelming and beautiful, and we keep giving the money away, and, and it has just been such a blessing. Thank you for your warm-hearted generosity. We appreciate it tremendously. You can go ahead and give online as you usually do, but we do appreciate your generosity and your faithfulness to the church at this time. God bless you. I have a message, and I'm going to just jump right into that message today. Uh, about the hiding place that God is for us. Story is told about somebody called a house and a little boy answered the phone. And he said, hello. And the man on the other end said, hello, can I speak to your dad? And he said, no. He said, well, well, maybe your mom is there. He said, yes. Well, can I speak to her? No, she's dying. Um, are there any other adults there that perhaps I could speak with? Yes, he said. The firemen are here. Oh, he said, well, well let me speak to one of them. No. Uh, perhaps there's anyone nearby? Yes, there's a policeman really close. Well, can I, can I talk to him? No. Well, what are all those people doing at your house? I want to talk about finding a hiding place in God. Finding a hiding place in God. Life isn't always a direct line of sight between cause and effect. Uh, when we sow to please the Holy Spirit, 
that seed may take a little bit of time to grow. So the people who dip in occasionally into the space of doing what is good and responding to the Holy Spirit's voice and, and, then, and then doing whatever they want, it, that doesn't always show the results of the wise choice because the wise choice when they sowed to please the Holy Spirit, uh, that harvest may take a little time to grow and, and so good and bad things are happening to them always and it gets lost. But there's something beautiful about people who choose to be habitual about about how they sow and how they choose to please the Holy Spirit. Eventually, uh, the people who habitually sow to please the Holy Spirit, uh, that sowing will become evident in our lives because what you consistently sow will eventually bear fruit. And what we sow bears fruit and what we habitually sow creates a lifestyle. And that's essentially what Paul is talking to the Galatians about. He says, listen, guys, you're doing the right things. Don't get weary in doing those right things. Even though you may not have seen the harvest come up, don't worry, your harvest is coming. So let me take you to Galatians 6, and I'm going to read from verse 7 to 10. Don't be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man will reap what he sows. And whoever sows to please their flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. But whoever sows to please the Spirit from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary in doing good. For at the proper time, we will reap the harvest of righteousness if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially those who belong to the family of believers. Far from being a rebuke, in these verses, Paul is talking to encourage believers who are being persecuted, even though they've been doing the right things, they've been sowing the right seed, they've been earnestly wanting to please the Holy Spirit. And while their crop is still growing, some evil people have come in and bad things are happening. And they're starting to wonder if it was worth it all because it looks like the bad guys are winning. Paul isn't here encouraging us to sow to earn for our salvation or to achieve God's favor or to try and ingratiate ourselves into the heart of God. All of those things were accomplished by Jesus at the cross. When we believed all of those, the favor of God, the, the, the placement of God, the, the reconnection with God were all assigned to us in Jesus Christ. They were achieved and delivered simply because we believed. But we are sowing because we have already achieved these things. And now we want to live a fruitful life in cooperation with the Holy Spirit. We sow because it's the right thing to do. And we like to go on this adventure as we walk with the Holy Spirit. So we pursue this adventure so that our position can become our practice. We are positionally seated with Christ and we want to learn how to make that position our practice. This is how we live. So those of us who habitually seek God out will discover that He is habitually found by us. Those who habitually sow to please Him will find that they habitually reap harvests. As the scripture says, those who keep on sowing their bread on the waters will soon see it returning on every wave. Now, all of the depths of God's wisdom and treasures and knowledge are found in Jesus Christ. And they are made available to every redeemed person who's interested enough to come and get him. All of the inheritance that Jesus secured for you and for me is experienced by those who ask for it. So we're not talking about works to achieve favor with God. We're talking about wisdom points that will secure a greater harvest of fruitfulness. Now recently, I've been reading Psalm 32 and a verse jumped out and bit me in the heart as David wrote it. And it's brought such comfort and security that I'd like to share it now because I feel like it's a word and a whisper for us at this time. Psalm 32 is quoted in the New Testament in, in, by Paul and in reference to the righteousness that is earned by faith and not by works. David wrote the psalm about how blessed are the people who God credits righteousness and doesn't hold their sins against them. And he speaks about his own sin and, and, and how he, he messed up. And then he talks about how God uh, is going to treat others. Many people believe that this psalm chronologically was written after Psalm 51 where David repented. And in Psalm 51, he said, I'm going to teach sinners your way. And so this is the psalm that he wrote after that. And he talks about what we can expect 
uh, to God, how God's going to deal with us. And then he talks about how there are two groups of people. Some are wicked and some are righteous and how God deals with them. But let me get to the verse that spoke to me and I think is for us all. You are my hiding place in verse 7. David said this, You are my hiding place. You will protect me from trouble and you'll surround me with songs of deliverance. This idea of God being a hiding place, a place where we can run and be hidden and and nobody can see where we are, a place of safety and security, of blessing, of prosperity, of peace, and, and that we hide ourselves there. This is a theme that's spun again and again, and especially by David throughout the Psalms. Psalm 119, 114, he said, You are my hiding place and my shield. I will wait for your word. Psalm 46, verse 1, God is a refuge and a strength, an ever-present help in a time of trouble. So before I unpack that verse, I want to just look at the, the, the second two things that God said, because I want to come back to focus on, you are my hiding place. But, but David said, you are my hiding place. And then the second stanza, the second piece of that, he said, you protect me from trouble. You are my hiding place. You will protect me from trouble. Somebody once said to me, trouble keeps finding me. And the answer is, Jesus will keep protecting you. But you and I have a choice to decide where we're going to be when trouble comes. The question is not, does trouble going, is trouble going to find you at some stage in your life? Yes. Some stage, every one of us is, finds ourselves staring down trouble. The question is, where do you want to be in your heart and in your mind and in your spirit when trouble comes? Because God is the God who likes to protect us from trouble. For those too strong for us, as David said, even from the trouble that we ourselves have created, God wants to protect us from that trouble too. He hides us and he protects us from trouble. It's one of the things that David said is a benefit, is a, is a part of finding God as my hiding place. When I come to him and I hide in him, he protects me from trouble. Now, I don't know one, what troubles you may be facing, but this one thing I do know That if you will pursue the Lord, if you will reach in and make Him your hiding place, He will protect you from trouble. Some of the troubles in my life were my own foolishness. Some of the troubles in my life were my own negligence. Some of the troubles in my life were just other people just being mean. Whatever the troubles, God will protect us from them. So Psalm 91. One thing I've asked of the Lord, this one thing do I seek that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to meditate and seek Him in His temple. For in the day of trouble, He will keep me safe from His dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of His sacred tent and set me on a rock. One of the versions of the Bible says, For there I'll be when trouble comes. When trouble comes to our life, where will you be found? And these two are inextricably linked, making God our hiding place and experiencing His protection. Duck behind the shield and the arrows won't hit you. Sounds pretty obvious. But if we'll make the Most High our hiding place, if He becomes our shelter, if we hide in the shelter of His presence, then trouble can't find us and trouble will be broken over our lives. Friends, I don't know if you're facing any trouble, but I have an answer for you. You are my hiding place. You protect me. You will protect me from trouble. Second thing he said, you will surround me with songs of deliverance. You are my hiding place. You will protect me from trouble. You surround me with songs of deliverance. Not everybody knows that God likes to surround his people with songs. God sings over our lives. He rejoices, dances, and shouts over your life. The God who watches you, who never slumbers or sleeps, who who knows every hair on your head, who sees everything that's going on in your heart and still loves you anyway. The God who watches over your life loves to surround you. 
There's so much about you that He delights in because He fashioned you for a purpose. And He doesn't just see what is in your heart currently. He also sees who you are going to become because He's put His call on your life. He's put His hand on your life. He hasn't forgotten you. In the scriptures, he said, I, 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 could no, I could no longer, like a mother, the child at her breast. He said, even if that was possible, even if that mother could forget, I will not forget you is what the Lord said. And that's simply what the Lord's doing. He's watching over you. Now, he, he's going to sing over your life. He's going to rejoice over you. And if you'll just take a little time, if you find God in the hiding place, not only will He protect you from trouble, but He'll sing songs of deliverance over you. And if you're quiet enough, you'll begin to hear the songs of deliverance. Zephaniah 3 verse 17 says, The Lord your God is with you, a mighty warrior who saves. He will take great delight in you. In His love, He will no longer rebuke you, but He will rejoice over you with singing. The mighty warrior who saves is rejoicing right now over you with singing. And the Bible says that those who will seek Him, that is going to be the benefit. That word for rejoice over you means to speak around with great joy, to shout aloud, to sing loudly with songs of deliverance. Now, I'm intrigued that the Bible doesn't say the song of deliverance. It says songs of deliverance. He's not a one-hit wonder here. There are overwhelming floods and streams of different songs of deliverance. And you're saying, but my circumstances are unique. The knot that I've bound my life up into is just too tight. I can't get out. Well, there is a song of deliverance from God even for that. There are songs of deliverance that God wants to sing over your life. And David said, all three work together. You are my hiding place. You will protect me from trouble and you'll surround me with songs of deliverance. I want to talk about this idea that David said, you are my hiding place. See, if I'm, if I'm out on, going for a walk and uh, I'm caught out in a massive thunderstorm, I'm up on a mountain, a massive thunderstorm is coming and there's lightning and it's dangerous. And I look over and I see a hiding place, a cave that is protected in back. And I go, oh, look, there's a hiding place. But I don't personally run into it. Then that's just a hiding place. But David didn't say you are a hiding place. He said you are my hiding place. You are the place that I go to when trouble comes. There is a place that I've discovered, David said, and I run to him. He is my hiding place. You know, the, the gospel of substitution makes him our refuge who otherwise would have been our judge. It makes the one whose holiness would have forced our rejection to be the one by whose holiness we can now enter. Whose presence uh, used to make us scatter and try and cover ourselves now is the one to whom we run as our hiding place. His presence is our life. See, our real safety, both spiritually and physically, is not the absence of danger, but the presence of Jesus. You are my hiding place, David said. And let's face it, David had ample opportunity to make use of the Lord as his hiding place. David had people wanting to kill him and deceive him and fight him. And he, he didn't just say a, a hiding place. He said my hiding place. I'm not standing around just merely acknowledging that God could be a hiding place. I'm going to make him mine. So I want to ask you a question. Where do you hide when life squeezes you tightly? See, we won't learn to reign in life by one Christ Jesus if we haven't learned that our life are hidden in Christ Jesus. Celebrating our hiddenness in Jesus is a great joy. He is our hiding place. Our shame, our condemnation, our accusation cannot find us, cannot get access to us because we have entered the hiding place of Jesus. Now, I know that you know this. I know that this is what our gospel declares. When you believed, you were taken by the Holy Spirit. You were put to death, the old you. The old you was circumcised off. You were baptized into the body of Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit. You were sealed in the body of Christ. And you are now hidden with Christ in God. You are hidden in 
in Christ. And I understand that that's exactly where you are positionally. But I want to say that you and I have a responsibility too. I want to encourage you as a wisdom principle to come to Him and make Him your stronghold. Psalm 37, David said, The salvation of the righteous comes from the Lord. He is their stronghold in times of trouble. The Lord helps them and delivers them, and He delivers them from the wicked and saves them because they take refuge in Him. I'm going to encourage you in this time that you say, Lord, I am going to be the somebody who decides where I hide. You have to make a decision. I'm going to decide where I hide. I have discovered, I've stumbled upon a truth. Jesus wants to be a hiding place for me. He wants to be a place that protects me and surrounds me with songs of deliverance. So the moment I'm feeling squeezed, the moment life is pressuring me, the moment enemies assail me, I have made a decision. I know where to go. I know where the hiding place is. And I just want to say to you, friends, we've been squeezed a little in this COVID time. This is your moment. Decide where you hide. Decide to come running. And the Bible says, because they take refuge in Him, the Lord helps them and delivers them. So make up your mind to take refuge in the Lord. And if I'm going to make, secondly, if I'm going to make the Lord my hiding place, I have to practice running towards the hiding place. Not just decide where to hide, but practice running to that hiding place. Proverbs 18.10 says, The name of the Lord is a fortified tower, and the righteous run to it and are safe. Some people say, well, you know, you guys are just wimps. You just, you just lean on God like a crutch. Yeah, more than that, I lean on Him for everything. I have made a decision. I decide where to hide. I know where to hide, and I run towards Him. When the day of trouble comes, I go running to the safe place. It's the logical thing to do. If you're facing pressure, if you're facing trouble, if you're facing lack, I have some good news for you. The name of the Lord is going to be a strong tower for you. And you can run in, run to the Lord and find peace and find safety and find hope. Decide where to hide. Practice running. Make it a habit. I'm going to run. And so I I would just encourage you in the mornings when you get up, go after God. Go running to Him. Say, Lord, here I am. I'm ready for the orders of the day. What do you want us to do? Where should we go? What should I accomplish today? What is your will, my Father? Thirdly, I want to say, if you want to make the Lord your hiding place, you are my hiding place, then we have to learn to dwell in the secret place. Decide where to hide. Practice running there and then learn how to dwell in that secret place. Just imagine if we're up on a mountain and the storm is coming and we run into a cave and it's beautiful. And there's space for everything that we need. And the storm is raging and the lightning and wind is blowing and hail is coming down. But we're safe and warm and provisioned in this place where God is our hiding place. I want you to imagine that Jesus makes this offer to you. If you'll come in and make me your hiding place, then I'll provide everything you need. You can be at rest and at peace while a storm rages outside, but it will not touch you. Psalm 91. Because you have made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place, no evil will befall you nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. See, he didn't say because the Lord made himself your dwelling. He said, you have made the Lord your dwelling place. So I just want to say, practice this dwelling in the presence of the Lord. I'd like to give you an an idea. I'd like to give you a suggestion. Why don't you take a little moment, go somewhere and say, Lord, here I am. Take 10 minutes, 15 minutes, and just Dwell there. Don't have to pray. You don't have to sing. You don't have to read. Just go and sit with the Lord. Learn how to listen to His voice. So let me recap this all for us. David said, and it's a great truth for us right now, You are my hiding place. You will protect me from trouble. You will surround me with songs of deliverance. Right now is a moment 
where the invitation, the offer from the Spirit of God is wide open. Come running to Jesus. Find Him to be your hiding place. And when you do, I will protect you from trouble. And I'm going to surround you. Stereo, quadraphonic sound. I'm going to surround you with songs of deliverance, beautiful songs. You're going to see me blessing and changing and changing everything around you, but it will not come near you. But in order for us to do that, that is already in provisioned for us in the cross of Jesus. But in order for you and I to experience that, make up your mind, decide where you hide, practice running to that hiding place. And when you're there, learn how to dwell. Because if you've made the Lord your dwelling place, then no harm can come to you. We miss you guys. We're looking forward to getting back together again. We're thinking through how to have worship evenings and how to have baptismal services and how to do all these wonderful things in a post-COVID world. Um, and uh, we're praying for you regularly. We pray for you every single day, in fact. And uh, we can't wait to get back together again. God bless you and thanks for being with us today. Greg, once again, thank you so much for that encouraging message. Uh, as we do every single week, we want to close our time with opportunity for ministry. We have an incredible ministry team that is praying for us throughout the week. And as they pray, they receive what the Bible describes as words of knowledge. If you're not familiar with that term, what we've found to be true and what we see in the scriptures is oftentimes when we are praying and uh, speaking to the Lord, He'll oftentimes speak back to us. And these are words of knowledge. He'll speak to us about the circumstances of our lives, the things that we are experiencing, all because He wants to minister to us. And so as we close today, you're going to see that comes up on the screen phrases, sentences, or perhaps even a single word that might describe your circumstances or the situation that you're currently experiencing. And if that is the case, we want to stand with you. We want to pray with you and see the Lord break out in your life. And so if you would like prayer, all you have to do is go to northlands.church forward slash prayer request. And one of our prayer ministry team members would love to reach out to you and pray with you over the phone. It does not have to be a word of knowledge though. If you need prayer for anything whatsoever and it's not on the screen, please also go to northlands.church forward slash prayer request. We want to pray with you as well. Uh, as I've already mentioned, but I wanna mention it once again, for all of our resources and information that you need during this time while we are physically separated, you can find that info at northlands.church forward slash newsletter. With that, have a phenomenal rest of your Mother's Day. And yet once again, moms, we are so grateful for you. Blessings.